Okay. I think we can start. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our fourth uh, talk at the Sharp Power series. This week, we have another important uh, speaker, another expert who will be talking about Chinese, uh, sorry, Russian uh, sharp power. Vincent Charles Keating is an associate professor and head of section for international politics, Center for War Studies, University of Denmark. He holds an MSc in nationalism studies from the University of Edinburgh and a PhD in international politics from Aberystwyth University. His quartered work on Russian soft power has been published in the journal International Politics and the Journal of International Relations and Development. Before SDU, he held a position at the University of Durham and has been an invited guest professor at University Paris Pantheon, Assas Paris II. In addition to Russian soft power, Vincent's research spans a number of other topics, including the challenges of the war on terror on international human rights, the role of trust and distrust in international security, and how international non-governmental organizations maintain their global legitimacy. Uh, today's topic is titled Sharp Power or Something More, Reconceptualizing Russian Influence Beyond Unwanted Flows of inf Information. Thank you for joining us and over to you, Vincent. Thank you. Great, and, and thank you for inviting me to, uh, to, to speak on this. Um, so, um, <clears throat> Like I said, my name is Vincent. I'm coming to you from uh, from Odense in Denmark, uh, which is uh, you know where the University of Southern Denmark is, and it's also uh, the birthplace of Hans Christian Andersen, uh, which is uh, if you ever come here, they will never let you forget that. Um, but uh, that might be the only global connection that I can think of right now uh, that might locate uh, you know uh, you know where I am and uh, where my institution is. But today, um, you know, I want to sort of discuss with you uh, some some ongoing research uh, that we've been doing at the Center of War Studies uh, at the University of Southern Denmark with some partners that we have, and that is uh, on exactly how it is that we think about the nature of Russian influence, uh, particularly the nature of Russian influence in the West. And what I hope to get out of this presentation for for everyone that's watching it is uh, is basically a, a, an argument that when we are understanding our predominant understanding of Russian influence in the West has been largely thought of in, in, in two ways, right? Um, one is a persistence fo focus on propaganda and the other is a persistence focus on disinformation. And what I would like to argue uh, to kind of tie it into the series is that the, the concept of sharp power largely rep replicates these types of characterizations. And, uh, and I want to start with that because that's kind of the building block from which we proceed with our research, which is not to say that any of this is necessarily wrong or misled, but perhaps that it's, uh, that it's missing a vital element in understanding the nature of Russian influence, and that is ideological attraction. Okay, so that's, that's where I hope to get to, right, uh, you know, in, in, my, in my talk today. So I should say, uh, you know, before continuing that, like a lot of research uh, these days, uh, this is a, uh, you know, this is a joint effort. So I work uh, with both uh, Olivier Schmidt, uh, who works uh, with me at the Center for War Studies, and Katarzyna Kazmowska, uh, who uh, helped me co-wrote the, the first piece on this uh, at the University of Edinburgh. Um, and of course, I am not a native Russian speaker, uh, whereas Katarzyna uh, has learned it, so that makes it a little bit easier on that side. But it also means I'm not really a Russian expert in that sense. Um, so, uh, so I would ask you to direct any specific Russian questions uh, to Katarzyna, uh, you know, over email. Um, I'm sure she would be very happy to uh, to, to to reply to to any of those things. So I want to sort of start by painting a picture of how it is that we've come to understand the nature of Russian influence, particularly how it's represented in the popular and science, popular media and in scientific journals. And um, I haven't done an exhaustive search on this, but the but the first kind of mention that that that, that I found uh, on the idea of propaganda or disinformation goes back to 
2014, uh, when we start having the first articles uh, in the popular media, this, of course, in foreign affairs, talking about this, this new phenomenon, as it would be at the time. And of course, with any new phenomenon, one of the things we have to think about is what is this? Um, and what I want to sort of go over is how it is that this has been persistently characterized. Right? So this, this article right here, 2014, is about propaganda. Um, if we go into the next year, all of a sudden we have the concept of information warfare. Okay, as a way of, of, of thinking about how, you know, what this relationship between Russia and the West is starting to be and how it is we should conceptualize the nature of this increasingly adversarial uh, relationship. Uh, you know, in two, 2016, we start hearing reports about uh, troll armies. Okay, uh, you know, the, so again, the, the use of the internet uh, for for uh, for disinformation and propaganda purposes on the behalf of the Russian regime. In you know we continue on with the idea that this is all about now social media and how uh, Russia is sort of you know operationalizing social media in order to spread these messages. And of course, this eventually gets to the point where the United States government starts to be concerned about the extent of this influence uh, on their country and of course more more broadly on on, on other western countries and um, so this is a this is an article from 2018 um, you know that suggests that this could be election interference is something we, we need to increasingly think about and this this type of framing and message about how it is that the Russians are going to interfere and, and, and negatively influence the the democratic processes continues into the 2020 election and of course, you know, continues basically to this day. I mean, this is an article from 2021 um, by Anna Applebaum, who of course is very uh, prominent uh, in, in, in discussing these things. And, and again, is it, the, the whole characterization, as you can see in the subtext is uh, a new report lays out why Russian disinformation succeeds, okay? So in the popular media, we, we, we have this evolving story, right? And we have, we have a couple of different terms that are used to try to describe exactly what's going on. This is largely reflected in the, acad in the academic literature as well. So uh, in 2016, Rand, which I'm sure many of you are, are familiar with, uh, comes out a with a report calling this the, the firehood of falsehood uh, model. Uh, so it's a it's, it's a nice it's a nice image uh, that they're conveying here, right? You know, so it's just piles of lies coming out of you know uh, Russia at a, at a at a high rate. Okay. Uh, over in Denmark, uh, you know, the Danish Institute for International Studies uh, released uh, a report on the weaponization of information uh, to suit uh, Russian political purposes in 2017, and. Uh, and we also had some research coming out of the University of Copenhagen that sort of characterized this as subversion, right? Uh, and, and, and sort of thought about it as purposeful destabilization and undermining of authority, right? As sort of the central goals of, of what this, uh, you know, what this influence was about. Now this, you know, is, is you know, brings me to the, the, the primary topic of, uh, of, of, your, uh, of, your, of your series, which of course is sharp power. Uh, because the concept of sharp power comes out amidst all of these different terms attempting to figure out what exactly does this mean, right? What, how is it that we should properly understand the nature of Russian influence? Um, primarily led by Christopher Walker, uh, you know, who published a number of pieces and, uh, you know, was involved in uh, the original report for the National Endowment uh, for Democracy. And this largely reflects, I would say, a lot of the standard uh, ways that I've kind of suggested before, weaponized information, firehood of falsehood, um, that, that we see when, when a lot of academics and, and, and sort of practitioners think about the nature of Russian influence. So if you ask what exactly is this concept, of course, you know, the traditional definition is that it, you know, sharp power, you know, is not hard power, it's not soft power, it's something different, right? Uh, and it, of course, pierces, penetrates, or perforates the political and information environment, environments of the target countries, you know, which is nice alliteration. There's a nice a lot of P's going on there, um, you know, so, so uh, you know, so that's, uh, you know, makes it easier to remember, perhaps. 
Um, but the but the whole point is that you know it's all about manipulation, right? It's the use of it, it manipulation to degrade the integrity of independent, read de liberal democratic institutions. <clears throat> and basically, what it does is is that it employs manipulation. Distraction is another way of framing it. Uh, now it, you can see it's it's characterized as nefarious. Okay, so it, it doesn't seem to be productive in any way. And it seeks to impair free expression, compromise, and neutralize independent institutions, distort the political environment. Okay, so this is you know what what sharp power is to uh, to to the scholars that work on it. Now, why does it work? Like so, this this is what it is. You might ask, why does it work? <clears throat> and the primary answer is that it takes advantage of an asymmetry uh, between our free systems um, and having the freedom of speech and unfree systems. And, uh, you know, uh, Christopher Walker furthermore characterized it as the dark side of technological interdependence that we have now. Um, and what it tries to do is blurs these perceptions, right? So it tries to portray Russia as somewhat better than it is. And of course it tries to portray the West as somewhat worse, okay? And of course this has Again, corrosive effects. Okay, so we can see again language that suggests it's it's completely non-productive unto itself. It seeks to really destroy uh, in 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 certain ways across um, all kinds of uh, various uh, institutions and sectors. And so it's very important to note that they're very clear that sharp power is not soft power. And the reason why it is is because it it attempts to nestle itself. As, 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 as the text reads, within the democracies and tries to look like soft power. But really what it is, is just censorship or manipulation, right? To basically undermine the integrity of the institutions that we have. And importantly, unlike soft power, which is fundamentally about attraction, um, these influence efforts rely again on manipulate manipulation, censorship. This is a message coming from a, you know, same message coming from a later publication, okay? So that's, you know, the differentiation um, that, uh, that Walker attempts to make here. And this is a differentiation that is also made in, in, a, in a lot of the current literature. So here's a, a short list uh, of the literature that at least I know about um, that really focuses on a similar concepts of propaganda or disinformation as its primary focus. So this is, uh, you know, so you can see there's no holding up of, uh, of, of, of research in this area. So where does that leave us, okay? Well, it's, it's really about sort of how it is that we understand Russia, Russian influence, you know, specifically how it is that technology is affecting it. And like I said, we have these two concepts of propaganda and disinformation. I've kind of tried to, analytically separate them out, uh, you know, they obviously will overlap in, in some cir circumstances, but if you have the idea that propaganda portrays Russia positively or the West negatively, and then dis disinformation might be more about confusion, confusion and lies, um, again, this is, this is how we think about it. And so Olivier Schmidt and I, uh, in, a, in an article last year, basically said that, you know, the primary means of thinking about Russian influence is there is kind of of these unwanted flows of information. Okay, so the idea is, is that we have the internet and the internet is wonderful for many reasons. Uh, it brings us, you know, we can download academic papers very easily. We can watch cat videos really easily. Uh, so it brings all kinds of benefits to society, but, because it's about flows of information, it can also be used for nefarious means that Christopher Walker picked up on. And of course, if this is how you think about the problem, that it is about unwanted flows of information, uh, you know, crossing the, the, you know, the digital divide between, uh, you know, the former East and West, then of course, this is how you're going to think about any solutions, right? That would then be tailored to address this problem. And so, this is where, of course, we come in, right? Is, is this idea that, you know, these are the main ways that we sort of think about Russian influence in the West. And as you can see, there's empty boxes here that I'm about to fill up. And um, because what we want to add to this discussion is the idea that there is also soft power and ideological attraction. And that this is a very different phenomenon 
because instead of trying to confuse Western audiences or portray Russia positively or the West negatively, it's all about followership and Russian leadership. And it's also important because what it does theoretically is different. Okay, so in, instead of trying to create some sort of ethical equivalence or induce apolitical responses through, through sheer confusion, what this does, at least according to Nye's theory, is it generates support for Russian foreign policy, which is why it's power, right? Um, so that's kind of where I want to get to. And of course, to get to, we have to go through a, a little bit of a walk to understand what we're talking about when, we're, when, you know, when we talk about soft power. Um, of course, you almost everyone here probably knows it. It's a term co coined by Joseph Nye, and it refers to how it is that a state can be attractive. And he lists a couple of uh, reasons or uh, variables as to what generates this attractiveness. Of course, it's culture, like Broadway, uh, it's political values, and of course, it's foreign policies. And for Joseph Nye, if you can you know, have these things being attractive to others, it allows you to influence others. Okay? And of course, in being able to influence, that's the power in soft power. Okay? It, makes, it makes it easier for you to get the foreign policy outcomes that you want. Now, when it comes to Russia, um, you know, there's been a wide idea that, you know, that this simply doesn't exist. So I'm showing you a picture right here. This is back in 2016 when I first had the initial ideas of uh, this project and I was presenting them to see if people thought they were crazy or not. And, uh, and there was a presentation. Uh, and of course, there's these posters went up all over, uh, you know, the University of Southern Denmark. And uh, I took this picture because on one of them, someone wrote on top, and I apologize to audiences out here, it says Putin is an asshole. Okay. And I put this here because it's a, it's a, I think it is, you know, within certain audiences in the West, this is, you know, how we think about it. Uh, and it's also reflected in a lot of the ideas that have traditionally come out of academia about Russian soft power. So even back as far as 2012, right, we have this idea that, you know, Russia doesn't have a model that it can successfully export. Right, um, you know, it doesn't have freedom, democracy, the rule of law, social stability, respect for human rights. Right, um, you know, moving on in time. Right, another an, another article suggesting that it possesses almost no political soft power for its neighbors or partners. Uh, again, unable to make its domestic, social, economic, and political model attractive. Right, and sell it to other nations. And then coming up a little bit closer to the present, again, Anna Applebaum, basically arguing that the Kremlin isn't trying to sell any model whatsoever. In fact, it's only against things, okay? So instead of agitating, as she writes, it seeks to keep audiences distracted and cynical. Instead of offering a positive vision, Russia promulgates nihilism, okay? So again, that, this is this just, just to demonstrate the, the, you know, how it is that this idea is, is reasonably pervasive. But the thing about it is, you know, if you step back and ask yourself, well, what exactly generates political attractiveness? And if you go back to Nye, uh, you know, he suggests two different factors. Uh, the first is having political values that reflect universal values. And then of course you have to conduct your foreign policy on the, base, on the basis of these universal values. So of course, this basically means you can't be a, a vicious hypocrite. Right. You can't, you, you know, if you're going to profess something, you need to in some way at least align your foreign policy with these values. And if you can do that, then of course it, it, it generates soft power. And if you can fulfill both of these requirements, according to Nye, you are likely going to be a state with large soft power resources. But of course, the question that you might ask yourself is: what exactly are universal values? Right? And Nye, of course, addresses this point, right? He, he, he says, well, soft power resources and what is considered universal values are going to be contextual, right? Uh, he notes that even societies themselves within a society, it's not like people have uniform values. And then once he's done with saying with that, he then continues to say, and this is replicated in most of the literature, but actually it's really liberal democracy. Okay. It's a really liberal democracy that is the universal value, because that is the refer reference point that they bring up again and again and again 
as to what is assumed to generate soft power resources, right? So as, as Nye claims, many values, democracy, human rights, individual opportunities are those values that are deeply seductive globally, okay? Um, powerful sources of attraction. And who has them? Well, guess what? The United States does, right? According to Joseph Nye. Okay, so, you know, obviously the Americans were very happy about this message because, you know, it basically meant to have influence in the world. You just had to be you. Uh, and, uh, and so, you know, obviously that was taken up uh, as, as a positive message uh, in the United States. But again, right, we, we have this idea that, you know, the institutions and international rules, uh, rule of law, liberal democratic nature, right, is what is attractive. Okay, despite the caveat at the very beginning. So what does this mean for Russian soft power uh, studies? Well, what it means is that, you know, if this is what's attractive, that means that you really only have cultural values. And in the Russian soft power literature that exists, this is, this is what they study, right? Because you've basically eliminated uh, cognitively the ideological part. So what you do is that you look for language, you look for you know, I mean, you maybe you read Russian literature, you read Dostoevsky or Tolstoy or someone, right? Um, and maybe that, you know, is 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 how Russians uh, get their soft power influences. Um, and of course, in this focus, because they almost focus always on this post-Soviet space, because if this is what you think, you know, generates soft power capabilities, only the cultural side, of course, it's going to be the near neighbors where you're most likely going to find this. So. Most of the research tends to, you know, focus on this and, of course, kind of ignores the rest of the world. So that was a big lead in to our argument. And I can you can probably imagine, uh, you know, where it's going at this point. Um, but uh, basically, the, the, the big argument is that the soft power scholarship has a, a massive liberal democratic bias. Uh, and that this is a, a fundamental problem in, in how we understand soft power. Because what it does is it automatically eliminates any possibility that the conservative values put out by the Russian regime can be attractive. And it leads scholars to either focus on studying cultural values as soft power or instrumental programs like propaganda and disinformation. And what we wanna say is that if you relax this assumption, if you start with the idea, maybe conservative values can be attractive to those in the West, then in fact, it's not, very, it's not very difficult to find data that suggests that people, you know, certain politicians, leaders, elites in the West first openly admire Russian values okay, in the media. Okay, and then when and where they do, there is a reasonably high correlation with them then openly supporting Russian foreign policy. And of course, this is exactly what soft power is supposed to do. The fact that they admire Putin or Russia in the media, right, is, is nice in a way for Putin and Russia, uh, but this isn't about a popularity contest in soft power, right? Soft power is about power, right? And so the second thing is, is that when and where they do, they tend to support controversial Russian foreign policy, which again is exactly what soft power is supposed to do. So this is all tied up in what some have called Russia's conservative, turn after uh, what has been characterized as a decade of ideological emptiness after the fall of the Soviet Union. Um, since, and I put a date here, you can object to it, right, but about 2011, um, you know, Russia has started to reposition itself as a leader of a conservative, patriarchal, and Christian Europe. And, you know, based on, you know, uh, historical examples like Alexander III, uh, you know, you know, Putin's Russia has increasingly sort of, you know, uh, sold itself as the conservative pole in the concert of, of great powers. And we argue and uh, that it manifests itself in many ways. Uh, there's the article, uh, if you want to go and sort of, this will be a very brief synopsis of how it, of how we think it does. Um, but one way that it does is uh, through uh, moral conservatism, uh, spe spe especially Christian conservatism. And the second one is uh, via strong leadership. So the first one in terms of moral conservatism is how Russia is openly seen as an aspiration to what some have called traditional values activism. 
Um, and again, it doesn't, it doesn't take very long to find European leaders, particularly on the particularly populists and particularly on the far right populists, but sometimes on the left as well, uh, you know, openly, openly praising Putin or openly praising Russia here, Marine Le Pen, um, for, you know, how it is that he respects the common values of, of the European civilization. And of course, what are those common values? It's the Christian heritage, according to them, okay? That he, you know, is one who will speak out, uh, you know, for this, uh, for this Christian her heritage. You know, Italian fascists uh, also like Putin, uh, you know, so I mean, they, and again, we'll openly talk about, you know, in, in one of these quotes, Mo Moscow is the third Rome, and the role of Russia in, in history is to revive Christianity. Over on the other side of the pond in the United States, Pat Buchanan, uh, former, uh, former Republican, uh, well, I mean, he ran in the Republican primary uh, for, for the president, presidency. Uh, you know, again, you know, sees this as P Putin as an ally, an ally for traditional Christianity, for conservatism, um, against liberal liberalism, basically. Um, so these are a few. Again, there are more examples in the text, but just to give you a flavor of, of what I'm talking about. Um, so we can see, you know, this sort of open response again, openly in the media, people praising Russia, praising Putin. Um, for an ideological stance that they feel that they also share. Okay. You can also see this uh, in terms of uh, how Putin has reflected in ideas of strong leadership. Uh, so uh, Nigel Farage, of course, a famous uh, UKIP uh, leader, so you know, was a major force in uh, leading to Brexit. Uh, when asked who is it that he most admired, he, he could have chosen anyone, but he chose Putin uh, as the person he most admired. Uh, Mike Pence uh, made an argument that Vladimir Putin, it's inarguable, by the way, that Vladimir Putin has been a stronger leader in his country than Barack Obama has been in his country. Uh, Rudy Giuliani uh, backed that idea up, you know, saying that when Putin makes a decision, he executes it quickly, that, then everyone reacts. That's what you call a leader. President Obama, he's got to think about it. So. It shouldn't be totally surprising that Republicans like Mike Pence and, and Rudy Giuliani are going to hate on Obama. I mean, that is, you know, that's, you know, that's politics. But what is interesting is how they could, you know, they, they could go to anyone as an example. And the person that they go to as an example is actually Vladimir Putin. Okay. So, like I said, uh, you know, the, the key thing is that this isn't a popularity contest. It also supports, it also creates support for Russian foreign policy. So we found that basically everybody, almost everybody who openly supported uh, Russian ideological values in one way or another, also, for instance, supported the invasion of Crimea, right? So the, the, the European far right basically blamed the European Union uh, for everything instead of blaming Russia. Okay? And this was a position that was held by, by far right leaders uh, in many states in Europe. Uh, Trump you know, uh, chimed in, basically saying that the people of Crimea, from what I've heard, uh, would rather be in with uh, Russia than where they were. And, uh, and finally, uh, Carter Page, who was a former uh, Trump uh, policy advisor before being entangled uh, in the Russian uh, influence uh, election uh, interference uh, scandal, uh, of course, you know, echoes these concepts, right? It's the so-called annexation of Crimea. It's no different in Syria. Okay, Marine Le Pen, you know, basically praising Russia uh, for uh, for its intervention in Syria, where the European Union is, has failed, according to her. And again, Donald Trump, right, totally behind the idea that Putin and Russia should go into and, and, and back, uh, you know, and, and fight in Syria. Okay, as and as he put it, I can't understand how anyone would be against it. So the point is, and again, there are many more examples in, in, in the paper itself, if you, if you want to check it out, but, but we have this, this consistent pattern, right, of open support for Russian conservative values and then support for Russian foreign policy. And I think what the problem is, is that despite the fact that this, this pattern is, is, is really out in the open, is that we, we, we constantly get this idea of instrumentalization, right? So when, 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 you know, Viktor Orban decided to, you know, I mean, let's say complicate things, right, and, you know, continues to complicate things um, in terms of the European response to Russia, 
right? We have this idea, right, put, 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 put out by um, uh, Peter Krego, that you know he's behaving like a tool of Russian foreign policy, and I think this is this is this is a constant characterization that we have that this is still only some weird instrumental thing that we just don't understand, um, and that's despite the fact that previous studies. And this study was done in 2016, and I haven't managed to find something that uh, that, that replicates it, uh, you know, in you know, uh, in a more contemporary uh, setting. But you know, a study basically showed that you know they surveyed 41 representatives of anti-establishment parties on both the left and the right, and found all of them to be sympathetic to Vladimir Putin's Russia. Okay, so what we kind of want to argue is that you know maybe we're undervaluing this right by by focusing on instrumental programs where we're kind of losing a uh, part of the picture um, and again just to reemphasize right it's not that you can't see this in an instrumental way and it's not that propaganda and disinformation have no effect they they definitely do and you can definitely study them in that way but i think this is an and argument in the sense that you know we we are perhaps undervaluing and, and continue to undervalue, uh, you know, Russian soft power. Despite the fact that, of course, you know, we know that they're starting to fund each other. Uh, we know that there's links, there's links between evangelical Christian groups and, 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 and Russia, um, and in general, conservative nationalist and anti-globalist groups. Um, so there is, you know, the formation of a, of a conservative uh, international uh, and and for some reason we 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 don't see this as you know maybe it's not that they're just pawns of each other or paid off with money maybe they actually agree with what each other is saying uh, you know which is then becomes a different problem so a few more stats just to sort of get us through this to show you how this can affect the difference. Uh, you know you have these heterogeneous reactions to Russia coming up to the war in in Ukraine. Uh, particularly in the United States, Republicans are far more likely than Democrats overall to see Russia as a friend or ally. They are far less likely to think that Russian influence, uh, you know, was inappropriate. And in 2021, you know, is Russia a geopolitical threat? Um, there is a vast difference um, between Republican and Democratic perceptions of Russia. Now, to bring this into the sort of current frame, um, I want to talk a little bit about Crimea, um, because the interesting thing about this is that as soon as this happened, uh, there was all kinds of articles coming out about how this would negatively affect the right. Okay, so there was a presupposition that all of these people who shilled for Putin uh, over the last couple of years are now going to be annihilated, right, politically um, because of the because of the the invasion of Ukraine. And, you know, so we have, we have an article here that basically says, again, for many years, they have praised Mr. Putin uh, for his policies of closed borders, ethno-nationalist rhetoric, and belligerence towards Western alliances. Now, all of these leaders are trying to back putt pedal without completely reversing their previous positions, okay? And to a certain extent, this, this plays out, right? So, I mean, polls, uh, uh, this one by the Pew Research Center, Right, have shown that there have been drops right, in, in the amount of support uh, you know, that, that even right-wing groups have, uh, have, have given Russia because of the invasion. And you might think about, okay, so you know, what exactly is, is, is the nature of those drops? And I have to say this, this part of the, 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 uh, the presentation is, is more speculative, is how I'm gonna put it. So these are more hypotheses than, uh, than sort of something that, that I can probably defend uh, strongly, but just to throw out some ideas. Um, you know, one idea is there is something universal, uh, you know, to get back to Joseph Ly, uh, Nye's uh, characterization of human suffering, right? And the pictures coming out of the war, particularly the duration of the war, right, uh, you know, speaks to something that is broadly non-ideological in some sense, right? Um, there's also an incompatibility uh, with the Russians' use of language, uh, you know, particularly the, the, you know, the, the, the difference between what, what Nazis mean to Russians uh, in Russian society versus what Nazis mean to, to the West, uh, you know, that sort of makes the, the communication of, of, of the justification a little bit different, difficult. 
And of course, if you're going to be a strong leader and that's your narrative, you shouldn't lose the war or be losing the war, right? So of course, you know, it, it, the, the military failures of Russia, uh, you know, it's difficult to play into the strong leadership, strong state uh, narrative uh, and then lose to Ukraine or, or, or <clears throat> perhaps not lose. I'll put an asterisk by that. Um, but let's say they, they've had more complications uh, than they would have liked. But even despite this, there is this conservative messaging that still comes out. So they, they haven't given up on this, right? So the Russian Orthodox Church backs the war in Ukraine. Uh, you know, they focus on, uh, you know, anti-LGBT, uh, uh, you know, messages. Um, Putin does it, in fact, in, in, in the speech a couple of weeks ago, right, you know, there was an entire section on that, um, you know, and again, promoting, again, the conservative message, trying to remind people about the ideological unity. <clears throat> and we can see that it has certain resonances, right, it's, it's certainly not gone, okay, so I mean, on, on the more dark reaches of the internet, uh, it's not difficult to find, uh, you know, people still uh, praising Putin uh, for his conservatism. Uh, and, you know, you have elected representatives, right, who, uh, you know, in, 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 in the House that have come out and basically backed it as well, despite everything that has gone on. And again, you know, the crowd, you know, at the event chanting Putin, 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 uh, where, uh, where she spoke. So it's definitely an influence that, that isn't gone. Um, and... You know, we need to remember that, uh, you know, that the, the war isn't exactly universally condemned. Uh, you know, so, I mean, our, our message on, on the war, right, you know, I mean, hasn't exactly broken through towards to, to, to all places all around the world. And of course, we have this idea that, you know, part of this, at least in this explanation, is, is because of how Russian manages to characterize, uh, you know, what it is that we're doing. Um, Again, though, right, via manipulation, right, is, is how this is understood. So we're still back to, you know, this is really about manipulation and disinformation. We have, you know, certain events happening, uh, you know, so the far right party in Germany decided they want to take a trip to Ukraine and the Russian held reasons to see it. Okay, so they still thought that was a good idea. Uh, they eventually, eventually backed down from that. Um, but we have, you know, incidences of pro- Putin chants at uh, various, uh, you know, uh, various uh, sporting events. Okay, so again, it doesn't really seem to be dead, dead, right? And I think that's, I think that's important when we think about well, where, where do we go from here? Because it's definitely causing certain problems with Western solidarity. Uh, you know, as as we increasingly get, uh, you know, right wing uh, politicians, uh, you know, who are who might be more receptive. To the Russian ideological message uh, in power in Europe and perhaps in the United States. Of course, it's going to potentially create problems for how it is that we collectively deal with Russia, particularly because it, it seems that it didn't really, you know, I mean, right-wing populists are still getting elected, uh, you know, in, in, in Hungary and, of course, in uh, re most recently in Italy. And despite the fact that, that there has been a drop in overall support by the right, it's still far higher uh, amongst right-wing groups than it is um, for the population overall, okay? So this is another uh, Pew Research Center poll that shows you the green is basically a far-right party and the support uh, for Russia or having a favorable opinion of Russia, right? Versus the, the blue is the population overall. Um, and you can see, I mean, throughout the, the, the selected sample that they have here, there is, there is a, there's a large difference in, in some cases even if that uh, difference doesn't constitute uh, a, a majority uh, amongst those members. Um, we can still see that there's, there's, there's clearly more, uh, more support uh, broadly for the among right-wing populists than uh, the population at large. And then, you know, finally, we have this idea that, you know, Trump is still around. And, and needless to say, he, you know, initially said that, you know, the Ukraine invasion was great. Uh, you know, and, and, and of course, people ridiculed him for doing this, um, you know, because Trump is being Trump. Uh, but again, I think there's a wider context here where, where we might say he, he likes Putin and he likes Russia and he likes the values. Uh, you know, he's spoken out for them in the past. And so it shouldn't be super surprising, 
right? All things being equal, right? There are other variables that play potentially, but it shouldn't be super surprising that he would be more likely to come out in favor of this than perhaps others. So um, Katagina and I uh, wrote an op-ed a while ago about this, uh, you know, and I think this sort of sums up, I hope, the, the, the point of the whole thing. Um, because, you know, if this holds water, uh, this argument, uh, then, of course, you know, as we write, it means that countering Russian influence is not simply a matter of, of fact checking, right, to counter these, as Olivier Schmidt and I put it, unwanted flows of information, right. So giving people the right facts, right, is not going to be super effective against populists that have already bought into the message. Um, and, you know, just, just to put, put, a, put a point on it, right, you know, we, we say these people are not confused. They have not misunderstood the issues, nor, have, nor are they simply useful idiots for the Russian state. They believe that the conservative values put forward by the Russian regime are also their values. The problem is therefore not one of access to the right information. The problem is fundamentally ideological. So in conclusion, right, uh, you know, we, we have an idea that widespread liberal bias that exists within the soft power research basically makes the idea that Russian ideological values can be attractive, it, go, it makes it go at the window. Um, you know, this is reflected in most of the literature on Russian soft power, right, which assumes that it's impossible to do this. Um, so it focuses primarily on cultural soft power. And it's reflected in why we have this widespread academic and popular focus on instrumental communication strategies, propaganda and disinformation, which look a lot like sharp power. And, you know, we might want to see even after the Ukraine war, and I'll put a question mark on that, right? Because it's, it's unclear how this is going to affect things, but what we can't at least eliminate the possibility that Russia can still potentially be seen as a powerful symbol for authoritarian conservative democracy. That's how I'm framing it. I'm sure a political theorist might disagree, but those are the words I'm going to use. Um, and as a, as a working model, right, for, for far right and even potentially far, far left supporters. The last thing is, is this idea that, you know, it's not that propaganda and disinformation is wrong, and it's not that the concept of sharp power is wrong, but maybe what we should be thinking about is how the soft power of the conservative ideological values is a potential force multiplier for all of these things that we're already studying, right? Is it the case that those who are already going to be you know, susceptible to attraction to the ideology because it's theirs as well, right? You know, therefore are easy to influence in some way or another. And that's it. Uh, so, uh, you know, for any, any of those who are interested, there's a link to all of the publications and there are unpaywalled versions uh, for those of you who don't have uh, access to academic journals. Uh, and uh, other than that, I uh, look forward to taking any questions that people might have. Thank you, Vincent. This was a really very uh, impressive tour de force. And there are many things that could be unpacked, of course. And I hope our Q&A session will help to do that a little bit, maybe. Uh, so yes, um, in, in a way, the role model, as you showed here, for many conservatives are right, even center-right people in the West, is one of the attractive uh, aspects of the Putin regime. He is the man who gets things done easily uh, when there is a crisis, there is a fear, security threat, chaos in society threat to the majority of the society, they, they, they are disappearing, etc. And so Putin is the guy who can get things done without really chaotic debates and discussions in parliament, in the parliaments, in the public spheres in the West. So many societies really uh, willingly, they are emulating him. Uh, and you show the this uh, footage, not footage, the news item from Turkey, the uh, soccer football fans, they were chanting slogans in favor of Putin because Turkey was playing against Ukraine. But it's not just 
something about Ukraine. There are many polls and surveys in Turkey showing that uh, many Turks fear from the United States more than they fear from Russia as a security threat. So they fear that one day United States might in invade Turkey. So this is, I think, also showing that the Russian propaganda is working to a certain extent. Uh, so yes, we will have some questions and yeah, Fan, I can see you. Yes, go on, please. Thanks, Isham. Um, thanks, Vincent, for this really reflexive talk. And I think it's really thought provoking. I think at some point you mentioned like American imperialism being embedded in the theories and in international relations, for example, soft power and also sharp power. And at some point, like I had a feeling that you might feel that, you know, both of theory can be a little bit awkward when we talk about the expansion of America. And so like given all this, I think international relations is a discipline that can be really inclusive, especially when digital technology is being, being included, integrated into, for example, in information warfare and also war as well and I know one of your public one like some part of your research is based on drawn and target killing so I'm just wondering like I, I'm, I'm just wondering given the changing geopolitics and the changing you know dynamic of international relations for example the expansion of China's influence along its belt and road I wonder if there is indication from your research with regard to the future direction of international relations that can that that we can you know follow through. It's a big question. It's a big um, question. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> it's a big question. <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, I always, uh, you know, I always remind my students that uh, despite the fact that you know this is my job and you know I, I'm sort of paid to read and think about stuff, uh, nobody has the crystal ball. Um, you know, because uh, if, if we knew, if we knew what was going to happen and how it's going to turn out, uh, we would be rich, right? Uh, you know, so uh, I think, uh, I, I mean, it's, 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 it's a very difficult thing, right? I mean, I, and, I, and I don't know if I can add anything to the uh, now voluminous uh, research that's out there on the potential decline of the liberal order uh, and kind of the rise of, 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 of the re-rise of nationalism, uh, you know, and, 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 and sort of nativist sentiment. I think, um, you know, I think, you know, we're in for a rough ride, uh, you know, in the, in, the, in the next little while. I think it's going to be difficult to, to turn off, uh, you know, the, the, the trend that we've seen in the last 10 years um, where, you know, increasing nationalist and populist forces are, are competing for power uh, in major European and, and, and North American states. Uh, and I think, um, I think to a certain extent, um, what, what one of the reframings that, that I try to give my students sometimes just to get them to kind of think about it is, uh, you know, is, is it better to, to, to think about this in, in an international way, meaning inter interstate, um, or is it better to think about this as more of a global ideological, uh, you know, uh, fight um, where you have transnational connections and transnational actors uh, you know, trying to seize the power of the state uh, in, in many countries at the same time, all working off of similar playbooks. Um, and it would be interesting in a way, perhaps, to kind of map that, because, of course, you know, I mean, not all of them will agree, right? And who cooperates and who doesn't would be, would be an interesting question. Um, but I think, I think increasingly, I mean, to the, to the extent that, that these groups can, can capture the power of the state, through, through elections, uh, you know, or, uh, you know, through other means, uh, which is always possible. Um, it creates, it creates problems for, for, for any type of liberal democratic order, uh, because they then can walk in and, and act as spoilers. Uh, and uh, I don't, I don't predict total gloom and doom. Um, but I think, I think it's going to be bumpy. And I think to a certain extent, I mean, I can only hope that this leads to kind of a reinvigoration of, of why we value liberalism. Uh, you know, uh, it's, it's, you know, liberalism, as, as, as it's often said, is, is extremely boring. Uh, you know, it tells you, you get to lead the life that you want, so long as you don't mess with others' lives, 
but other than that, it really doesn't say a whole lot, right? Uh, so, you know, the, the, the passion of more conservative uh, ideologies that basically say, no, here is the order and we need to achieve it because the current order is unjust, right? You know, you can imagine that being a drawing force, uh, you know, amongst lots of constituencies. Um, so again, I think if anything, it, it re-emphasizes you know, in the need to get back to basics that you know, the, you know, the, the end of history hasn't happened. I think that's uh, very clear not to do too much uh, damage to Fukuyama. Uh, but, uh, but I think the real problem is, is that you know, ever since that article came out, right, we, we, uh, you know, everyone critiques it. Right? But then actually in their everyday thinking about international politics implicitly buys into all of its assumptions. Right, you know, implicitly buys in that oh, this is just a blip. Of course, liberal democracy will come back. Right, we all know it's the best. You know, and I think I think that's perhaps the danger is to is to is to forget that this is that it's fundamentally political, and you have to fight for it. I have no idea if that answered your question, but I mean, it was it was broad, so I tried to go. That does. It's a really broad question. Yeah. Thanks for your response. That's very helpful. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Vincent. Martin. Yes, thank you so much. This was super interesting. Um, and um, uh, you sort of talked about the sort of um, the way that uh, Russian sort of um, the conservative term and the sort of moral conservatism and the strong leadership that has sort of an appeal in, in many European sort of political parties or far right political parties. Um, I just uh, I remember um, back in 2019 when the commission was first announced, um, there was the new DG to protect the the European way of life, which drew a lot of criticism for how vague what the way of life for Europeans was. Um, and I just wanted to hear your thoughts about um, sort of the way that, you know, we've seen a conservative turn uh, sort of all over Europe, not just in far right parties, um, but also in the more traditional right wing parties. France is a great example where you have uh, several sort of les Républicains uh, politicians, one of whom like worked for a, a Russian bank uh, and was only recently told to you know, quit from that. Um, I'm talking about Francois Fillon. Um, mm -hmm. And I just wanted to, to hear your thoughts about um, yeah, how sort of the, 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 the conservative model that uh, Russia seems to be exuding um, is sort of laying the groundwork on a more global level, European level than just far right political parties. Yeah, I mean, absolutely, right? Because I mean, in, in sort of emphasizing the far right political parties, we, we you, you're absolutely right. You can't ignore um, the effect that their existence, right, in politics has affected more traditional parties, both on the left and the right. Um, I know that, I mean, the, the, the I mean, I mean, I'm from Denmark, so you know, well, not from Denmark, but you know, I live in Denmark. So I'm like the social Democrats in Denmark, fun fact, you know, are very moved very far, you know, to the right on issues of immigration than where they used to be before um, in order to counter the, the threat of the Danish People's Party. And you see this type of, of movement happening, you know, all over Europe and, uh, you know, I guess throughout the West, right? This, this appeal to nationalism, this appeal to, uh, you know, the, the ongoing sort of disruptions of, of economic globalization, right? Uh, you know, and, and, and sort of like a, an incompatible, incompatibility uh, with, uh, you know, people's sense of kind of ontological security about who they are and what they're doing amidst, you know, something that is kind of known for disruption, right, you know, uh, and, uh, and I think uh, we're, we're seeing the political effects, not only in, in, in how these far right parties, uh, you know, are, are, you know, continue to be popular, uh, but like you said, I mean, how it sort of pulls in other parties to, to take up these policies in order to, you know, not to save some votes. I think the interesting thing, and I don't, and, and I haven't really seen a lot yet on this, is whether or not this makes those more mainstream parties trend towards Russia themselves. I haven't seen anything on that yet, so I, so I can't, I can't say that 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 is happening because of their rightward shift, and it and it might be um, because despite the fact that they're getting more conservative on particular issues like immigration. Um, you know, they're still not, they, they don't see it as Christian Europe, for instance, right? You know, they don't see, they don't necessarily see the, the totalitarian allure of the great leader. Um, so perhaps they're, and it's an interesting question, there are very specific core ideological values um, that, that, that need to be shared um, that, you know, make you more prone to this. Um, whereas other ones that might 
be more associated with the right, um, like uh, you know, more nationalist, anti-immigration, xenophobic, even policies, uh, you know, can be can reside within centrist parties, but not lead to uh, this this uh, this uh, soft power on on, the, on behalf of the Russian regime. Thank Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Vincent. Can I not? Oh, thank you. Thank you, Vincent. The talk has been um, really interesting. And um, from what I can gather, uh, we see this, this contestation of ideas and ideologies in different countries. So my question would be um, that do you think authoritarian, authoritarian regimes like Russia, do they have different uh, devices and implementation strategies when they engage with countries that are uh, aligned ideologically with them? Or sometimes do you feel they have a different ideology or a strategy for countries um, that are politically diverted from them? So um, I'd be interested if you could give us some examples um, to sort of like answer this question. Yeah, and, and unfortunately, I don't know. Uh, it's, the, it's a very short, short answer. Uh, you know, I mean, part, part of the problem, like I said, is that I, I don't do Russian politics. Uh, you know, I, I come in from the point of view of international political sociology. Um, so uh, my my colleague Katarzyna Kazmaska might have a good answer for you, but but I wouldn't I I, I don't know unfortunately. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Vincent. Uh, Andre, it's your turn. Thank you, thank you for a, a fascinating, thought provoking uh, presentation. Uh, in, in listening to you and in thinking about the whole. Um, you know, concept of sharp power and this shifting with regards to the liberal bias uh, that uh, you're finding within the uh, uh, in the the soft power framework. You know, I was thinking historically you know, about the pendulum. It's sort of like the Reformation and then the Counter Reformation, uh, and then it, which was also a shift to putting power in the hands of people away from the authoritarian more centralized uh, church at the time. Or in the 20th century, the, what we're seeing now perhaps is this shift uh, from you know, the role of empires and strong sovereigns uh, to the, the type of universal values exemplified, let's say at the peak with the establishment of the United Nations, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, et cetera. And now this pushback uh, with regard to uh, illiberalism, of, as some have characterized it, or authoritarianism, or the types of traditional culture-centric values that might have existed uh, you know, prior to the, uh, the the spread of universalism. I've tended to think of you know, of this as uh, as uh, zero sum versus uh, shared prosperity. That the uh, the zero sum aspect is uh, that strong leaders, one country, one power is going to be on top uh, and pushing its values uh, versus the more you know, that we can collaborate all together. Uh, now, I'm, the question is: Do you think that in uh, that the changed environment from let's say seventy five years ago? when uh, I, you know, I think the pre-digital um, pre environment favored uh, more authoritarian uh, zero-sum rule, that now in the current environment where there's more information sharing, there's more ability to, uh, uh, to uh, collaborate and work together, that this environment, does it favor or disfavor the the type of um, uh, you know, a liberalism or illiberalism. I mean, what does the current the current uh, information environment favor as far as the, what we might see going forward? Yeah, and um, yeah. So I mean, obviously there there are there are there kind of conflicting uh, views on on this issue, right? Um, you you do have a thesis that uh, you know that uh, liberalism is embedded. In the technologies, right? Uh, you know, so this is a thesis that some people will will come forward with, and basically, you know, linking the fact that with any any sort of you know the the the, the, the framework of a technology, right? The the the, the, uh, the kind of kind of sociological socio political environment, right, will affect how that works, and therefore, exactly as you say, right? I mean, this idea of freedom of information, 
right, uh, then sort of comes out of how, you know, how the internet and, and, and related technologies are, are built. But of course, that, you know, that's just about how it is that you move information from one place to another. Uh, and I think, you know, uh, you know, Christopher Walker's point and, and others have, have made it as well about this, this potential problem of, of asymmetry uh, between uh, conservative and liberal regimes, um, where conservative regimes, in some ways, at least in this specific way, right, have a little bit more resilience because they control, right? Uh, you know, they, 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 they are more likely to directly control the way that the information goes. And of course, you know, you can go around and stuff like that, but all of that adds cost, right, to communication, uh, you know, and that's kind of what they want to do. Whereas, you know, you know, people, uh, you know, who have liberal values, uh, you know, we, we, we ideally want an open internet. And I think uh, that that means that part of what we have to tolerate, and there's a big debate over how much we have to tolerate it, right? You know, means that sometimes people are going to say things that we don't want them to say, right? Uh, and I think um, that that point that, uh, that that Christopher Walker makes is is you know is 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 reasonable uh, in terms of like how it is that you know control over information technology probably matters if looked at in isolation, right? Um, you know, there's all kinds of other factors that affect the stability of more authoritarian regimes. So, of course, that's why I say in isolation. Um, but, but I would definitely see that as an advantage in on, on their side of things. Thank you. Yeah, it's a, a lot yeah. to talk about, and I, I appreciate there's, your response. There's a lot going on. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Uh, we have a colleague who had to leave for another meeting, Bilant Kenesh. Here's a question in the chat. I'll just read this question. As a target and a victim of Erdogan's regime in Turkey, I'd like to hear some of your assessments on Erdogan regime's close relations with Putin during your eye-opening presentation. What do you think about Erdogan regime's pro-Russian, pro-Putin policies? Do you think that these close actually odd relations between these two autocratic leaders will have some adverse effects over the security and stability of the western part of the world thanks yeah and and I, and again i'm going to have to uh, i'm going to have to punt this one a little bit because of course i'm not a turkish uh, you know uh, a turkish uh, you know a political expert um but i mean it's it, it is to a certain extent i mean if if you know, I mean, if you're under pressure from liberal institutions to reform, um, it's not super surprising that, again, all things being equal, there are other factors involved that uh, that that you might look to other regimes that are under similar pressure, right, to see whether or not you can make something out of it. Um, and I think you know that that's going to be an ongoing problem, um, you know, particularly in, in in Europe and you know, sort of broader Europe. I guess if we're going to include Turkey in this. Uh, you know, when, when we have these type of more authoritarian regimes that that challenge the, 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 the you know, the, the liberal values, um, you know, that have been put forward by institutions like the European Union, um, uh, you know, to cause, you know, certain types of disruption. And uh, when we try to push back in various ways, there's, the, there's the, always the question about, you know, are we, are we doing it successfully or are we going to alienate them so that they, they go into, you know, other alliances, uh, you know, in an easier way. And I think it's, I think it's a big challenge, uh, you know, because I mean, ideally you want them to sort of stay within all of the institutions, right. You know, all of the Western institutions, uh, you know, because we have an idea that, you know, this kind of promotes dialogue and it promotes all of the democratic principles that, that, that we'd like. Um, and at the same point, you have to probably draw the line somewhere as to what is considered acceptable and unacceptable conduct, knowing that, you know, you want to make sure whatever the nature of that punishment uh, is, uh, is, uh, you know, doesn't lead them to basically leave, you know, or, or fall or basically say, I, why, why am I dealing with you telling me how I should run my country? This guy over here doesn't care, right? So... Thank you, Vincent. Are there any other questions? No, thank you. I have, I raised my, my hand again. Oh, sorry, the... I didn't see it, Andre. Yes, that's, that's right. Yeah. Um, yes, you'd made up, you mentioned earlier in your, in your presentation that the discussion between those arguing for liberalism and those uh, for more conservative values, that it seemed to indicate that, that those arguing for liberalism 
are at a disadvantage because liberalism is somewhat boring. But aren't you, in, in saying it that way, aren't you conceding something which may not necessarily be the case? I mean, is there not actually a stronger case that can be made for a very exciting liberalism uh, with regard to the fact that you know, it, it is a positive thing that people are seen equally with, with universal values. It's a positive thing that, this, that the rights of minorities are safeguarded by rule of law. All of the various things that, are, you know, that, that have been reasons in the past for championing liberalism still exist as good arguments. Why were you saying it was boring? Well, I think I think uh, you know I was I was kind of caricaturizing it uh, you know a bit, and uh, you know I mean I completely agree with your point, but I think that political argument needs to be made is 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 kind of the the, the key uh, the key issue, um, you know. Getting back to my 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 brief comment about how we implicitly buy into everything Fukuyama says, even though we criticize him for saying it, right? Part of this is you know this perhaps assumption that no, it will all work out. And you know we don't have to fight for it in the same way that previous generations had to fight for it. Um, and I think exactly re, re, refocusing and, and re-energizing you know uh, you know people about why it is that rights are important. Why is it that you know freedom of the press is important? Uh, you know why is it that we we you know toleration is is important? Uh, is 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 something perhaps we need to more directly uh, you know address and really figuring out right? I mean the you know the reasons why it is that you have you know i mean substantial minority sometimes of, of western populations who feel completely alienated from all of this right uh you know i mean it's it's uh, again i think i think there's a there's a a re-emphasis of the political message of why we have this and why liberal democracy is good which seems basic to most of us right but again, I think we need to, I think the thing is we need to constantly fight that political fight, right? And, and, and think about how it is that given the political and sociological circumstances that are constantly changing, right? Whether or not we need to repackage those messages, um, you know, to, to have them be effective for all of the issues that, that people have now and will have in 10 years or will have in 50 years. Um, so I think that's perhaps, there. I mean, I think I, I take your call. There perhaps needs to be a little bit more dyna dynamism Right in in how we're thinking about and how we're selling these 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 core ideological values. Thank you again. Thank you, thank you both. Uh, we are twelve minutes over time, which is okay. And but this was a fascinating conversation. Thank you, Vincent. Yeah, thank next you for week we will me. have our thank you. We will next week we will have our fifth session this will be a panel session we will have three great speakers and a more empirical one in a sense and they will be looking at the sharp power in central europe and uh, the balkans and i hope to see you next week as well until next week have a good time thank you <laughs>